Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for coming. It's my pleasure to stay here today. I've been waiting for that long time, so uh, please enjoy. Uh, today I'm going to defend my thesis entitled uh, on the phase diagram of, of the superconducting ferromagnet, uranium, cobalt, germanium, and other unconventional superconductors. Uh, I want to start with uh, explaining what superconductors are and what superconductivity is. So superconductivity is the effect of exact zero resistance. Uh, was discovered in 1911 in, in Leiden, in Netherlands, by Kamerling Ones. So he was measuring uh, mercury, but also other metals, measuring the resistance, and he found that at 4.2 Kelvin, uh, the resistance drops to zero. So it was really strange, and uh, people didn't understand why is that. And uh, understanding came much later, and meanwhile, so over the past 100 years, the many, many materials were discovered to be superconducting. And in this diagram, you can see uh, many families of them. And what is actually interesting, especially for applications, is to find uh, high temperature superconductors. Here you can see, for example, uh, in the blue, E3 barium copper oxide is one of the most famous one, which uh, superconduct at uh, liquid nitrogen temperatures. Uh, so how, how can we use the superconductivity? Uh, superconductivity has many applications. Uh, for example, we use superconducting magnets in physics and in particle physics and fusion physics. Uh, nowadays, uh, in medicine, uh, every big hospital has MRI machine magnetic resonance imaging to, so it helps for medicine. And there are more uh, exotic applications, for example, uh, superconducting cables. So there is an idea that uh, we can transfer actually electricity without any losses using superconducting materials. Uh, in other applications like superconducting motors, so if we can make motors uh, smaller and more powerful, which actually make, which can drive ships, for example, in a better way. And uh, there is very exotic application, a superconducting train, which is actually experimental train already running in, in Japan, uh, which can go with 580 kilometers per hour. You cannot buy a ticket yet for that, but I think it's coming. So this will be one of the boring slides for you, but uh, I will try to go through that. So that's a theory explaining how superconductivity works. So in 1957, Bardin, Cooper, and Schrieffer uh, wrote a theory. So they proposed a theory ex explaining the superconductivity. So when we apply the current on, on our, let's say, metal, doesn't matter which metal, so the electrons, actually, they carry the, the energy. And in a normal metal, the, the lattice actually creates the let's say resistance, so electrons, they scatter over the lattice and we lose some energy meanwhile, so, and then it goes for heating. Uh, in, in case of superconductors, at certain circumstances, quite often it's low temperatures, uh, the energy of the lattice is so low that uh, electrons, they actually can, can couple together on long distances uh, via these lattice vibrations. It's called phonon uh, mediated superconductivity. Uh, but nowadays, over the past at least 15 years, we have found many materials where this mechanism doesn't work. And that's uh, another type of superconductivity, which I will describe in my thesis. It's a P-wave superconductivity or equal spin pairing mechanism. But here the medium which actually coupled the electrons is not uh, phonons, but it's actually the spin fluctuations. You can look at that also in a different picture. And uh, so the, now I want to move to the technical side of the projects. So how do we actually measure uh, and what do we measure? So uh, what I was measuring basically is, is the length. So it's very simple. Imagine you have a phase transition from uh, normal state to superconducting state. This is a second order phase transition. In, in this, with this phase transition, the length will have a dramatic change. You can th see, think of it as if you ex think, for example, of ice. You take a, a cube of ice and you melt it. So that's a phase transition. And uh, the volume of water will be different from the volume of ice. So the, when the ma material goes through the phase transition, it changes volume. So basically what I'm measuring is I'm measuring the volume or length with this uh, fascinating uh, dilatometer, it's called. And also we made it very small. 
and uh, we put it on a rotator in the cryostat to work below one Kelvin in high magnetic fields. And as a result is, is this phase diagram. So my thesis are entitled on the phase diagram, so all of my results are actually graphs like this. So this is a phase diagram of uranium cobalt germanium. So this is a ferromagnetic superconductor. And uh, I don't want to go too much into details, but uh, the, the nice f part of this was to actually detect S shape of the upper critical field. So it's in the blue circles. It was first time uh, measured by the bulk probe as a dilatometry. So this is the first part of my thesis. And the second part was dedicated to topological superconductors. And before going to that, I want to share with you uh, the, the future electronics, in my view. So all you, everybody of us now using smartphones, computers, and everywhere we use uh, a chips, which actually store our information. And it works now, and, and nulls and zero, you know, like computer science, people say bytes. So null is and one, and you can store information on that. But actually, nowadays, we can see that there is a tendency to try to build a quantum computer. So the computer which will work on uh, different mechanisms. So instead of zero and one, we can put the information in a spin of electron. And this electron can have two positions, up or down, and the superposition of them. So in one single bit, we can put more information than uh, previously. So this will be the revolution when we can uh, use these computers. It will change our society completely in terms of... Uh, how fast we can do calculations and what we can model with that. And at the moment, it's under development by big companies already starting developing their own quantum computers, but it's still far away from that. So I think quantum computer is looks like this half of this room now with the cryostats on it. And in order to actually make this progress faster, we have to study topological superconductors. And here I, I show examples of two systems which I have been studying also. So one of them on the right, homeo palladium bismuth, so it's a candidate for topological superconductivity. And it's actually ex exhibit also antiferromagnetic order uh, at very low temperatures. You see temperatures we use are very low, below two Kelvin. So it's still, not re it's still kind of far away from applications, but this is kind of fundamental part of it. So we first have to study the properties of, the, of such a systems in order to, that later on, people can catch up and make devices out of that. And on the left, uh, I showed the strontium bismuth selenide, so it's a, the third system I've been studying. So it's very interesting compound because bismuth selenide actually is a famous topological insulator, and we add a little bit of metal inside, and it's actually become superconducting. So that's, a, let's say, the fun way to, to create the topological superconductivity. And here we show the pressure temperature phase diagram. And uh, yeah, so my conclusion is, I hope I, I uh, made it clear that uh, superconductivity plays an important role in our life, but I am very sure that in the future it will play more, it will play a bigger role. And there will be, I would like to contribute to that thing. Thank you.
Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the special session of the Committee for Nuclear. Before starting the discussions, I invite Senator Jim Kelly. By authority of Rector Magnificus and the doctorate board of the university, I shall, during this hour, in order to obtain the doctorate, publicly defend my thesis entitled on the phase diagram of the superconducting ferromagnet uranium cobalt germanium and other unconventional superconductors. I entreat all those who wish to voice criticism of the contents of the thesis to do so in a truthful and lucid manner so as to provide an opportunity for an ordered exchange of views. Before starting our discussion, I'd like to welcome two guests from outside the University of Amsterdam 
Dr. McCollum from the Radboud University in Nijmegen and Professor Druk from the Technical University in Delft. I invite Dr. McCollum to start the opposition. First of all, I'd like to congratulate you and I very much enjoyed reading it very much and I agree with a lot of information and it's packed into, into the work that I did. Uh, especially, I liked how thorough you were experimentally and the way you were proposing and the way you decided what to put in and what to leave out. Well done. Well done. I do have some questions. Uh, in particular, I would like to focus on chapters four and five, where you deal uh, with Europe and the Soviet Union. Very important material, probably one of the most important materials that we have in the whole study of European <coughs> physics. And it's a weak itinerant ferromagnet. So I, I'd like you to start by clarifying what a weak itinerant ferromagnet is and how you see the development of that in the context of. Esteemed opponent, thank you very much for your kind words. Thank you for coming and reading my thesis. And uh, let's go to the question. So uranium cobalt germanium, uh, as you said, is an uh, itinerant ferromagnet, weak itinerant ferromagnet. So if I start in general with the ferromagnets, uh, there are, so the ferromagnets in general is the materials which uh, at certain temperature, let's say Curie point, uh, they order ferromagnetically in the way that uh, the spins align uh, at a certain direction, that they have a yeah, ordered moment. And there are many types of ferromagnets. For example, there is local moment uh, ferromagnets and itinerant. Uh, in terms of local moments, it means that the, the ions, for example, the heavy elements ions, uh, they actually carry the, the spin of the ion uh, is responsible for the ferromagnetism. Uh, in itinerant, uh, it's, it's not the ions which are responsible for the ferromagnetism, but that's the conduction electrons which uh, form the potential which, uh, let's say, aligned, uh, which has an effective moment, uh, often very weak, uh, which aligns along the preferential directions. In case of uranium cobalt germanium, it's a C axis, it's called EZ axis. And uh, yes, that's the case. Explain why it's a weak itinerant ferromagnet. Is that to do with the, the moment, or what, what's the yeah. difference between weak and strong? Yeah, the weak and strong. It's uh, in a matter of the magnitude of the of the effective moment, and in this system, it's very small. So, if we look, for example, for the saturation moment of uranium cobalt germanium along the c-axis, it will be in an order of 0.0. .0 Three, if I'm not uh, very wrong, so it's it's a very small number. If you look, for example, the the system which is not ferromagnet in this case, but anti-ferromagnet, homium palladium bismuth, it has ten Bohr magnetron, and this uranium cobalt germanium has 0.03. So what that's makes the moment so small? Why are some with such a small moment but still ferromagnetic, and some with a higher moment but is there a very fundamental difference in the band structure or something? Yes, so it should be a fundamental difference. So in case of uranium cobalt germanium, the, actually the electrons which, uh, the conducting electrons which uh, are responsible for superconductivity is uh, 4F electrons. And uh, in other systems, uh, you have to specify every system uh, uh, by itself. But in terms of uranium cobalt germanium, it's 4F electrons and it turns out that uh, it's <laughs> they, they are weak. Uh, yeah. I mean, in this particular system. That's I think there's also a, a difference between whether there are uh, both types of spin up and spin down electrons that mm -hmm. determine whether it's a strong itinerant ferromagnet that you need one or the other. Mm -hmm. Balanced system in the world. Um, My second question is about uh, the magnetostriction and the thermal expansion. So these are topics from chapters four and chapters five. Uh, chapter four and chapter five. We see a very large anisotropy in the, uh, the, both the thermal expansion and the magnetostriction. In particular, you see a, a difference, a, a contraction along A and C axis and a, an expansion along B axis or the other way around. Why is that? Is that 
normal? Is it expected? What's the reason for this anisotropy? Not just a difference in magnitude of the, the effect, but actually a difference in the whether it expands or contracts. Can you? Yes. Yeah, thank you for, for your question. Uh, yes, uh, indeed, in uranium cobalt germanium, all the proxies are very anisotropic, highly anisotropic. So it has three axes, C, B, and A. And C is the, the one which is called easy axis. And uh, all the proxies are anisotropic. Uh, it was first uh, discovered by uh, the transport. So when uh, uh, in our group before me, Anna was measuring, and uh, our competitors, Diaoki, when they measured the transport or up critical field, they found that it's varies. So, it, so it's very small for C axis, but very big for A and, and B. And uh, so that's the purpose of my research with the magnet restriction was to, to, to study these proxies with the magnet restriction. And what we found, first of all, I want to see what we found and then uh, why, uh, so what's behind that. So we found that uh, if you look to, uh, to uranium cobalt germanium, so if when we apply magnetic field along the, for example, C axis, so the easy magnetization axis, I can tell you which page is this. Page 63, uh, chapter five, figure 5.3. So when we apply field along C-axis, and uh, I measure magnet restriction, basically it's the change of the length. So I see that along the A-axis, uh, unit cell shrinks. So along the B-axis, unit cell expands. Along the C-axis, it again shrinks, and then it's actually a little bit stopped after nine Tesla. So it means that uh, when we apply field along the C-axis, uh, we uh, we change the, so the unit cell, the size of the unit cell is changing. So wh why is that? We can go uh, through that uh, step by step, but maybe, so w why the, it's, it's different from A to B and C-axis, so this anisotropy. Yes. 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 B axis is, is the softest one, and we see it from thermal expansion and from magnet restriction. Both uh, that's it's actually changed its length the most, and also this B axis is very interesting because uh, if you look to a critical field, it has S shape along the B axis. So if you think of it, so uh, so C axis is the axis where the uranium moments align and the B axis perpendicular to that. So when we uh, probe this axis, we can see that the, the most of, uh, let's say, fluctuations, if you would think of, if, if I'm allowed to say so, uh, they actually, the amplitude is the biggest along this direction. So along the B axis. So the crystal uh, have a tendency that it has more freedom along the B rather than along A axis. and. Uh, what is the nature goes, so what is lying behind that? So it's probably, we have to look to the crystal structure and we know that uh, uranium cobalt germanium has zigzag uh, chain of uranium atoms and it's actually uh, zigzag chain is aligned I think along A axis, so this is zigzag along A. So the one which is perpendicular to that is, has let's say more freedom or let's say softer. It's about the, the torque measurements uh, in chapter five. You, you make a comment at some point that the angle uh, theta of the magnetic field to the axis um, is positive or negative. How do you define whether that angle is positive or negative? For example, you say that the signal, uh, the torque increases when the angle is negative and decreases when the angle is by the C-axis magnetization, or how do you explain that? Okay, thank you for your question. Uh, first of all, to, in order to understand that, we have to make the picture how it works, so how cantilever works. So the cantilever is, is, is the plate where we put sample on top, and uh, we measure capacitance, uh, let's say, between bottom plate and top plate, like this. It's actually made in the picture. Let me refer you to picture 3.1, chapter 3. 
So that's the drawings of cantilever. And uh, so we put something like this. And if we apply a field exactly perpendicular to, let's say, the surface of the plate, and if I glue a sample in a way that its <laughs> C-axis is, is uh, orthogonal to the plate of the uh, cantilever, then that's what I called uh, zero degree. Of course, we, we can discuss how <laughs> good I glue it or not. And then when I, when, so let's say, when we rotate, so let's say we rotate this way, and uh, it's just a matter of description. So I, I say that the positive angle, let's say we rotate this way, mm -hmm. and then we apply a field. So then the, the sample actually wants to, C axis wants to turn along the field, so it wants to close the gap. So the capacitance is proportional to one divided by D. I define myself uh, basically yeah, in the way I want to. Yeah. It's not about physical, it's about how we say what is plus, what is minus. So I say that the plus is in a way that I apply field. Uh, so I have a, a negative angles and a curve is increasing, right? So it means that the distance is decreasing. So the, for me, negative angles are in a way that it goes, let's say, it opens, it's rotate in one direction. And if it's rotated in that direction, that will be a positive angle. So uh, yeah, I, I don't understand what's wrong with that. So it's about defining the angle. And I try to define it in all the measurements in one way. That's the point. Well, the next opponent will be Professor Brut. Candidate. It's been also for me a pleasure to, to read your book, and especially considering I was looking at uranium, cobalt, germanium, and other materials in the titanium, nickel, silicon type of structure 30 years ago. And I must say, I, I didn't have so nice samples as you now managed to make. And um, we didn't observe neither the ferromagnetism nor the superconductivity on, on, <laughs> on the samples, partly because we didn't look at these low temperatures, but still uh, very interesting results. And you took quite an effort to make samples. And I would like to discuss with you a little bit because there, there's been a kind of an old paper already from 2011 uh, in the Journal of the Physical Society of Japan. Influence of sample preparation technology and treatment on magnetism and superconductivity of uranium cobalt germanium. And the, the authors mentioned, for example, so it's strong effect of annealing on the polycrystalline samples, but there is not so much effect of annealing on the single crystalline samples. So I'd like to discuss a little bit with you about mm -hmm. so what you did and why you did it and, and so on. Okay. Highly esteemed opponent, thank you for your question, questions, and uh, thank you for kind words. Indeed, uh, pre sample preparations took uh, big part of my PhD, and I will go through that. So I was not the only one who did, so basically I prepared uh, polycrystals, and then in Kai Huan he was growing single crystals out of uh, these prepared, prepared batches. So first I was training on polycrystals, try to find optimal uh, solutions, how to make it, and of course there is uh, already literature and experience from previous uh, growing by uh, our group. So it was quite successful in terms of polycrystals. So uh, if you see in table 3.2, uh, page 38, uh, I tried, to, for example, to add a little bit of uranium or a little bit of cobalt, like 2% extra. And it, it went uh, quite good for, for example, for good fellow uranium. So then if you add a little bit of uranium and cobalt, so registration increases. But then it also depends on uranium so then I, I uh, actually measure pure uranium resistance ratio and found out that actually if you have the best uranium aims, it doesn't really necessary that from this 
the cleanest uranium or the highest resistance ratio uranium, you will make the highest resistance ratio uranium cobalt germanium samples. So from this table, I can say that uh, this CF yeah, France uranium, which has resistance ratio, not the best one, but second best, actually makes the, the best uh, polycrystals. But uh, later on, okay, me, uh, I start preparing uh, these big batches of polycrystals in order to uh, Dr. Im Kai Huang to make single crystals. And what we found that uh, single crystals grows uh, very good and the Lao picture quite often is nice, but uh, annealing actually did not improve very much. So that's a very crucial point uh, in terms of annealing the single crystal. And I tried many different procedures. So I tried to uh, anneal for two weeks at 900 degrees for three weeks, and then one day of 1200 degrees and, uh, and then followed by two weeks at 900 degrees. Then I also tried to anneal with uh, using turbo pump so it's like dynamic annealing. And uh, in fact, uh, the best single crystal I, so we made during my PhD time had a resistance ratio of uh, roughly eight. So which is uh, very good, but uh, I know it can be better, can be, better, can be done better. And uh, yes. Uh, it's it's not absolute quality. The absolute quality, of course, it has to be a very good single crystal, and it has to be proven by lower diffraction. And for every single crystal, we, we did lower diffraction. It's the first thing you have to check. And uh, we have to be sure that there are no impurities. Also, it can be X-ray diffraction, uh, just powder X-ray diffraction. And uh, the last thing which is important for my measurements it's in order to have a good superconductor, we should have a good resistance ratio. And the higher resistance ratio is, the, the better uh, sample quality it is. Let's say if you take resistance ratio five and 1,000, it will be, I will be very sure that the 1,000 resistance ratio is very good single crystal. But if you talk about five and seven, five and 10, then it's uh, maybe it's not uh, the best uh, probe to, to judge. Yeah, so I, I have the impression when you look at figure 4.1, where you have crystal 1 and crystal 2 for your um, thermal expansion ex experiments, from the sharpness of the phase transition, I would say crystal 1 is better than crystal 2, but the, um, the re resistance ratio is less. Yes, thank you for your question. Uh, I think you, you look to the sharpness of the ferromagnetic transition. If you look to sharpness of superconducting transition, it will be vice versa. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm very sure about uh, sharpness of superconducting transitions for crystal uh, two is sharper than crystal one. So here it's a little bit, uh, we have, uh, have to take into account interplay between superconductivity and ferromagnetism. Uh, this is still debatable, and, uh, but I would like to express my uh, opinion on, on this uh, point. So when, uh, for example, for crystal one, we have slightly higher uh, ferromagnetic transition temperatures, 275, and it is lower quality. At the same time, superconducting transition for crystal with a bit of lower quality has a superconducting transition 0.4 Kelvin, which is slightly lower than for crystal with the higher quality. So from this, I can kind of uh, conclude that the stronger, let's say, the, the stronger ferromagnetism you have in the system, the weaker superconductivity is present. So it's kind of, uh, it's not competition, but it's interplay between them because system is very close to a quantum critical point and uh, there the, this effect can interplay. But uh, again, this is uh, not very strong. We have to, I think, measure something with a very, very high resistance ratio quality and test our idea on that. Yeah, but, but you argue, argue you have your, um, the same electrons are responsible 
responsible for the ferromagnetism and for the superconductive activity. And the exchange interaction is mediated by, by the electrons. And so seemingly, I would say then, you should have the higher critical temperature in this ferromagnetic state should give you an, a quality uh, indication or not. Yeah, thank you for your question. Uh, this is, I would not uh, totally agree with that. I think it, it I can s say from, from experiments I've done and from uh, things uh, we observe that First of all, there is an error bar always in determination of the, the, the critical ferromagnetic temperature, the Curie temperature and superconducting transition temperature. In, in these measurements, uh, you can see that uh, there is a difference. And of course, uh, you, you, what I want to have is like 3 Kelvin uh, ferromagnetic transition and 0.6 superconductors, but in real system, it's not always like this. And, uh, at least for our samples and for the physics I've studied, uh, I think there is an interplay, yes. Okay, thank you. The next opponent will be Dr. Fischer. Dear candidate, uh, first of all, I would like to congratulate you with a nice work, nice story. Work, uh, for every nice work, So uh, let me start with uh, some sort of historical question. In, in the first, uh, I think, in the first paper on uh, superconductors by Michael Ginsburg, uh, he said that uh, the purpose of this paper is to point out the almost complete impossibility in practice of observing superconductivity in any sort of ferromagnets. And moreover, experiments to show superconductivity of uh, ferromagnets deserve a great, great deal of uh, attention, although uh, it is possible that they will not succeed. Why uh, Vitaly Ginsburg, who was uh, one of the fathers of the uh, famous ginsburg landau superconductivity, and he got actually a Nobel Prize for that, uh, why did he come to this conclusion? Esteemed opponent, uh, thank you for kind words and for interesting question. I know this paper, I, I read this paper by Ginsburg uh, in 1957, yes. So that was the first paper where the, the words ferromagnetic superconductors were used. And uh, we have to go back to this time, first of all, 57, and uh, to, sh to see why he came to these conclusions. So it was a time when uh, I think this paper was published even before the the Bardeen Cooper Schrieffer uh, paper, first of all. And uh, so there was no uh, microscopic theory at that time, so it was, let's say, Landau approach on this problem. And uh, second of all, if I remember correctly from this uh, paper, so he was taking, uh, he was talking about uh, uh, film films and uh, trying to see how the, let's say, if, we, if you have uh, thin films of superconductor or, or ferromagnet, fer ferromagnetic material, uh, how is its response on, let's say, introducing superconductivity on the surface? I would say it's more about proximity effects rather than uh, bulk coexistence. And he, I think in that paper, he, he, uh, he made a, his statement that if it will be possible, it will be possible only with very weak ferromagnets. And of course, with the, uh, with the citations you, you just uh, read about impossibility in practice, I'm quite sure in 1957 it was impossible to, to make uh, these conclusions that one day you will have ferromagnetic superconductor. So uh, I think the first ferromagnetic superconductor reali was realized in practice in 2000, uranium uh, germanium-2. And so you see half a century passed and we, and it's, it's, we, we should satisfy many criteria which were actually created later after Ginsburg, Fay and Apple. 
uh, that has to be weakened here magnet, has to be very low temperatures, uh, and so on. So to satisfy these criteria, it took, uh, I think, 50 years. So I don't think Ginsburg, uh, he was just not maybe very enthusiastic about that, but uh, he didn't say literally, I think, that it's impossible. I think he said that it is hardly possible. Yeah. What was written there? Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. Okay, so we proved that uh, he was wrong. So, uh, it's, it's a good uh, thing. Uh, so, um, my next question is about uh, your uh, theoretical uh, Can you uh, actually distinguish physics of uh, H states from uh, the bulk physics? Thank you for your question. So, yeah, let me explain first uh, the topological superconductivity a little bit. So, the topo in general, topologic, topological uh, systems, as the systems in which the edge states, or let's say surface states, are dominated, or let's say have a big impact in, 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 uh, in the whole system. So, when, when the, so normally, when we study crystals, we have a bulk, which is, let's say, superconducting. And uh, in, when we study the, the properties of superconductor, we're happy when the bulk is superconducting. But in, in topological superconductors, uh, if, let's say, surface states will, will have a different impact, uh, let's say they have a different temperature of super, different superconducting temperature, or they have special, uh, let's say, surface states in band structure are different. That would be interesting. So how, how can I detect in, in my, uh, using my experiments? Uh, so when I measure resistance, for example, it's, it will, we will not see that, uh, simply because we, if there is a, a path which already superconducting, then we see superconductivity uh, goes to zero. So then uh, you can maybe measure magnet resistance as a function of let's say, thickness of, of the material to see how this imp impacts. But I didn't do that because, uh, yeah, I had different, a little bit different goals of the research. Uh, also, if, for example, we had an, uh, this, uh, this idea for homeopalagian bismuth, if you look to the picture, figure 7.3, page 88, so AC susceptibility uh, at very small fields. On the red curve, we see that uh, there is a local maximum, so it's, it's an IL temperature, but then there is a drop in, in susceptibility, roughly 20%, uh, which we see in, res in resistivity at these temperatures at 1.7 Kelvin, that resistivity drops to zero, so this material become superconducting. But then later on, upon cooling, we see the, the the whole bulk starts to become superconducting only below 0.75 Kelvin. And we put this idea in this paper that it might be an indication of the topological superconductivity. But we have to be very careful with that. It's, uh, it's not direct proof and it's not, I think, solid proof. I think with the, you need to investigate more carefully on, on that subject. So it's, it's, it's very, Thank you. Solid. Uh, so as you know, of course, the uh, notion of topology in uh, materials is based on uh, famous quantum theory. So can you detect this very phase, for example, in uh, figment of Thank you for your question. Uh, the very phase, uh, I didn't, uh, first of all, I didn't investigate this very phase. Uh, but uh, how it works, I can explain. So, uh, when uh, system, when we, it only works in applied fields, so when we apply ma uh, magnetic field into the system, uh, the Shubnikov and the Haas, they detected many years ago the so-called quantum oscillations, which are forming uh, because of the quantization of the Fermi surface. And if you have a very clean system, uh, very nice material, and high magnetic fields, low temperatures, you 
can able to determine to to find quantum oscillations, which we we have seen in chromium, palladium, bismuth, and uranium, cobalt, germanium. And uh, then, if the let's say to study the the berry phase, uh, we need so if you, if you look to the equation of the Landau levels, the quantization so e n will be proportional to h bar omega n plus half. So this is standard equation for Landau levels, but the Berry phase will add uh, extra delta in in the between brackets. And this kind of delta we can uh, not, I didn't do that, but I think in principle it is possible if you expect to have Berry phase in the system, it's possible to uh, do angle dependence uh, magnetic resistance magnet measurements. So we change the angle, we detect oscillations and if we see that the period of oscillations is shifted, and then we plot uh, these maximums of these oscillations, and we see if it goes to, not to zero, but to some value, that will be the Berry phase. But the physics behind that, so what, what does that mean? So what Berry phase is? So it means that uh, the Fermi surface is, is having some kind of a Uh, change, yeah, change, but which change, uh, yeah, I have to specify. It's, it's a good question, it's change, but uh, some kind of uh, the holes, let's say, that's, uh, the, the, it's not a, a, an ellipsoid, but uh, let's say the donut shape. Or well, it, I'd like to interrupt this discussion in order to give the other opponents the opportunity to discuss with you. I invite Professor Schreck to continue the other candidate. Dear candidate, I also would like to uh, congratulate you on your nice work. And I thank you also for showing me your experiment several times and uh, uh, talking about what we are doing that day. And now I have an overview about the large amount of work you have done over the last four years and all the nice data you have taken. This is tremendous. So uh, what captured my attention was in figure 4.7, you see that the um, critical temperature rises actually if you apply a stronger and stronger magnetic field above six teslas. And I, I found this is quite remarkable. Do you have an idea what could be the mechanism behind this effect? Highly esteemed opponent, uh, thank you for your kind words and, and the question. Uh, you asking very fundamental and serious question, uh, which was uh, uh, running around uh, in the field of uranium cobalt germanium at least for at least five years, uh, maybe more. And first of all, we were not the first who detect S shape of up critical field for field applied along B axis. So the first people did it a few years ago with the transport. So they measure re magnet resistance and they track uh, that, uh, let's say, transition temperature with the field and they already had the indication that it has S shape. And to satisfy this uh, experiments, you have to have very precise alignment of the field, uh, of the magnetic fields with respect to the crystallographic axis, the B axis. Therefore, we implement the rotator and everything. This is very difficult experiments. And so, first of all. And second of all, yes, it has, let's say, remarkable S shape with the increasing the transition temperature above the six Tesla. And uh, the, the idea behind that is, is that uh, in uranium cobalt germanium, as I believe and I think many people believe now, uh, the superconductivity is mediated by spin fluctuations. And uh, the spin fluctuations, uh, ferromagnetic ones, and if we, let's say, make these fluctuations a little bit weaker, then superconductivity can, can win out of that. So if you look to Curie point at, at uh, blue points on this figure, and we see that uh, above six Tesla, the Curie point starts shifting uh, to lower temperatures. So that, let's say the magnetism become weaker. And that's actually was proposed by Minev and later on by other, other group that actually that uh, generates, the, let's say, the, the, the power or the, let's say the, the fluctuations which can uh, enhance the superconductivity at the same field range. 
So that's yeah, the main the main idea. If you look, for example, to red curve A axis, you see that QD point is stable. It's kind of uh, stable, and the uh, critical fields is just decreasing. We don't see any upturn. And but maybe when this QD temperature along the A axis will will go to low temperatures, it might be uh, to see upturn along the A axis, but it. This can be very high fields and very low temperatures that will be difficult to detect. Okay, thank you, that's interesting. Um, now I stumbled across another sentence on page 64. So you say that you can use the Shubnikov, the Haas oscillations to extract the Fermi surface in principle. <laughs> so I want to know a little bit more about how you Back this Fermi surface. For example, the Fermi surface is a 2D object in 3D space, so I suppose you need to make these oscillations by orienting the crystal along all different kinds of orientations. And then we always see a change in the resistance of one polarization and this uh, doesn't go to the field. And uh, yeah, this is correct what I'm saying there. And then uh, why is it only in principle? You took all this nice data. So mm -hmm. something went wrong here, so what went wrong? And could you still do something with your data? Highly esteemed opponent, uh, thank you for your question. It's it's very interesting question. Uh, in principle, it means here that uh, I didn't do all this work. So we, ha as you said uh, exactly, we have to measure along every axis, field along uh, all three axis and everything in between. It has to be, uh, very good crystal in order to detect them and uh, high fields quite often because if you have really s uh, small part of the Fermi surface, you can only probe it uh, by uh, having really high fields, both 30 Tesla or 20 Tesla. So uh, in, in the results I present here, you can see the figure 5.5 middle panel, very nice beatings the quantum oscillations extracted from magnet resistance. It took a lot of effort to, to get this data. Uh, but uh, from the beatings, you can, you can see that there are at least two frequencies present. And uh, I know from the people who, from another paper, Bastien at all, PRL 2016, that uh, if you go to higher fields and you have really good crystals, then you will see more frequencies. So actually what we probe, we probe only part of the Fermi surface and we only found two uh, part of them. So as, uh, as I wrote in this chapter, like cigar shaped, cigar shaped like and uh, ellipsoid with the effective masses uh, 14 and 18. But uh, there are more, so I'm sure there are more. And uh, there is at least one more with the one kilohertz frequency, kilotesla, excuse me, frequency which was observed if you go above 22 tesla and it is possible that there will be even uh, more parts or some kind of missing part of the Fermi surface. That's why I say in principle, so I only probe uh, part of it with this, my experiments. And uh, yeah, I think you still can observe uh, more. But for that, you need to have a good crystal. So resistance ratio of 30 even is not good enough. I think you should have something like 100 or even more. And then maybe not only resistance probe, uh, probe but as these uh, guys, uh, Bastien at all, did, they also de uh, observe quantum oscillations on thermal power. And we have a nice instrument which is called dilatometer. We can try to, if we have a nice crystal, to, to do magnet restriction. And but you can probably still extract some magnet restriction. I think we extracted. Uh, we extracted the uh, maximum out of them. I'm quite sure about that. So uh, what, what I've done together with actually my paranymph, uh, we measure temperature dependence, angle dependence of this. And uh, from temperature dependence, we observed the effective mass. From angle dependence, the geometry of this. So that's, uh, yeah, that's what we can do with the samples we have at the moment. And I think we extract maximum out of it. to go to 
the last opponent, Professor Gregor Gerwitz. Thank you, Mr. Rector. Dear candidate, so my esteemed, my esteemed colleagues already congratulated you on your thesis and I join into that. What I appreciate uh, from your thesis is that you actually put effort also in equipment, in, in preparing equipment. Apparently you're also quite happy and, and, and uh, oh, yeah, with it because you mentioned already your uh, machine to measure thermal expansion of, in that discussion. You mentioned it already twice, okay? So, uh, and that's, that's re remarkable, I think, uh, that you put your effort into that and you used our workshop. We have excellent workshop uh, and you have made a full, uh, or you have taken a full advantage of that. Now, uh, in my uh, opposition, I would like to go to those aspects. So I go to chapter three, where you discuss the equipment which you have used, and in particular, uh, the, the, your, your thermal expansion cell and the, and the, and the cell to measure uh, properties under high, under high pressure. Now, first, let me start with, uh, with that cell for pressure. So uh, I, I understand, is it, so first, is it, uh, is it a commercial cell or is it, uh, is it, is it custom made? Uh, second point is uh, in, a, in such a machine, in such a, in such a device, you have to use a medium yeah? and that can be gas or can be oil. Yeah, so you have chosen for oil when you go to low, low temperature, well, is that, is that a good choice? Why did you do that? Then when you do this, you, you, the, the medium is maybe penetrating into sample. You measure, you measure also resistivity, so the contacts can be affected. So my question is, can you, can you cycle your, your sample? Uh, and then uh, the last question on that is, which really is, uh, was strange to me, you mentioned about uh, when, uh, when you calibrate this. Yes, this calibration apparently is, is done by somebody and you use it. So is it stable? And also uh, you talk about the, the real pressure and the nominal pressure. Now, I, this I cannot understand. If you have a liquid, yeah, it will have equal it will have equal pressure everywhere. So I would like to hear your comments on that. Highly esteemed opponent, thank you for your kind words. And thank you in particular that you like my chapter three about experimental uh, part and about making these instruments. Okay, it's pressure cell, right? You want to know more about that. First of all, uh, I haven't done it myself, so this pressure cell was in the lab. So I think uh, it's not like purely commercially, but I, I think you can buy these kind of cells, uh, companies sell them with uh, all these uh, necessary uh, oils and everything. And uh, I think this particular one was, was made in Japan, if I'm uh, correct. And we, uh, we have a uh, doctor, Takashi Naka, who comes often and help. Uh, actually, he was teaching me how to use it, how to operate it, and he's, he was the expert. Uh, so I, I can tell you that I was just a user of this cell, but let me uh, describe it uh, a little bit about this oil. So the oil is the medium which uh, you put into the sample in order to pressurize, and uh, it can be not only oil, but uh, we use this oil because it's good for our, let's say, applications. Okay, I want to uh, answer quickly about maybe the last part of nominal and real pressure. So what does that mean? It means that uh, the nominal one is the pressure we apply at room temperature and uh, let's say one gigapascal after cooling uh, there will be some release, and after cooling, uh, we, we, not me, but uh, Dr. Tran Bai calibrated with the tin, and he found that at low temperatures, one gigapascal become 0.85. Let's see, that's the difference. Thank you. Well, this brings us to the end of our discussion. I ask the candidate to read the second part of the forum. Having thus concluded the defense of my thesis to the best of my ability, and pending the decision of the doctor, doctorate committee, I should like to express my sincere thanks to 
my highly esteemed supervisors in particular, as well as to those who have to, who have so custodiously brought forward the criticism and all who have honored this ceremony with their presence. Committee retires for further deliberations. who make pictures.
Esteemed candidate, after due considerations of the thesis you have submitted, we have decided to grant you the doctoral grade. It is already is authorized to convey this degree to your family and posterity. I most willingly accept the task assigned to me by the Rector Magnificus of the University. By virtue of the power conferred on us by law and in accordance with the decision of the rector and the doctorate board of the University of Amsterdam, I hereby confer upon you, Artem Maximovich Nikitin, the degree of doctor, and grant you all the rights pertaining to it by law or custom. As evidence hereof, you will be presented with a degree certificate signed by the rector and his supervisors and confirmed with the great seal of the university. Having thus fulfilled the task assigned to me, I have the honor of being the first to address you as the doctor and to congratulate you with the dignity conferred to you. Dear Artem, no better, and I, of course, say this with pleasure, uh, you are now a Dr. Nikitin, so I address you as dear Dr. Nikitin. You still have a smile on your face, as usual. <laughs> <laughs> During the whole defense, there was this smile, so <laughs> very good. So it's an honor for me to say a few words on this very special occasion. And let me start by uh, congratulating you with obtaining the doctor's title. My felicitations. I would also like to include uh, your girlfriend, Sabrina, your friends, your colleagues, and all the students here. It's really a pity, pity your uh, parents and your brothers and their families cannot be present today. I know you tried very hard to arrange visa for them, but the, with this new rule imposed by the Dutch government, uh, that they have to appear in person at the consulate to have their fingerprints taken, it's kind of impossible to obtain all these legal documents when you live in, like a remote part of Russia, like near Ufa, close to the Oral Mountains. However, it was a, a pleasure, a great pleasure for me to meet your parents here in Amsterdam two years ago. I'm sure they would have loved to come to the ceremony today. Let me extend uh, my congratulations to them as well. And to their I'm sure they are very proud. So it's about five years ago that I was searching for a PhD student to work on the phase diagram of the paramagnetic superconductor uranium cobalt germanium. The lecture proposal was approved by our funding agency POM. We had a colleague, Misha Hoogdorf, of the Low Temperature Lab of Moscow State University, and he brought your uh, curriculum vitae to my attention. So we spent a short time in Zurich to attend the school. It was quite easy to have you on board as your professor, and I believe there was immediately a good connection uh, between us. It clicked, uh, as we say in Swedish. Uh, and the 1st of June, you started, uh, that's 2012, you started your PhD project. I admit here that I, I was a little disappointed actually to learn only two days ago about the group meeting talk that you confessed that the real reason to join our group was not the challenge in physics, but the big sandwiches that were served to you. <laughs> <laughs> a 
okay. <laughs> but your PhD program uh, had a, a very large component in instrument development. And you had to design and construct a sensitive thermal expansion cell to measure length changes of fractions of angstroms of low temperatures. Strong magnetic fields, typically seen in Tesla. Moreover, the cell has to be located in situ to allow for a precise alignment of the magnetic field with the high symmetry directions of the crystal. The crystal in your case was your cobalt-germanium, an <coughs> unusual material. It was discovered in Amsterdam a few years earlier, and it combines the ferromagnetism of 3 Kelvin and superconductivity of 12 Kelvin. So that was certainly not an uh, easy task to make such a cell. Rain of low temperature physics showed that there were hurdles in the way, and the technical parts of the project took some more time than anticipated. But thanks to your persistent attitude, we came to know that the rain was indeed required, and thanks to your hard labor, you turned the project into a successful business. Your first publication reporting your results with the Gilles Electrometer. The importance of your work was recognized by the editors, and the publication was also selected as editor's suggestion. So the dilettometer, which in situ was very quickly developed, will certainly serve as a very useful instrument in the future lab. Thanks to you and your colleagues, there is even only one other lab in the world where they have In the course of your PhD project, you have also broadened your scope by carrying out experiments on various other interesting materials. In the test, you discovered superconductivity in the antiferromagnet half oyster compound holding palladium bismuth. And you performed a series of high pressure experiments to demonstrate the robustness of the rotation energy system of the metallurgical superconductor strontium bismuth. And you also carried out a nice Human spin rotation and rotation experiments at the Carl Scherer Institute in Switzerland with the ferromagnetic superconductor of the strontium bismuth compound in Holland, Germany. As regards the scientific output, you are first author of three papers and co author of five more papers. And you presented the results in postal and oral form at several international meetings, conferences, notably the Correlated Electron Conferences in Tokyo, in Grenoble, and Barcelona. It's clear that in these four and a half years you have become an expert in measurement techniques at very low temperatures. Thermal expansion, heat restriction, torque mechanospermetry, electron conductivity, and very few measurements. Furthermore, you made use of very high pressures and strong magnetic fields. You have cooled down the Helios and the Calvinox systems many, many times, prepped the superconducting magnets to their maximum fields, and they use up their energy. To complete the equipment full, you must have siphoned many liters of steam from the magnetic field, a quantity that possibly could have filled a modest swimming pool. Uh, it's obvious that you like the world of the very cold, which I believe is connected to your growing up close to the Ural Mountains, where winter days with temperatures of minus 25 degrees are not uncommon. Item. It was a great pleasure to have you in the lab in the past years. Not only for your skillful operation of the research equipment and the physics, but also for your social mindset. It was a great ship you brought to the group. So you were always prepared to help and assist your fellow PhD students to survive and you are to survive and you pan and you are Dr. Yupan and a newcomer watching from the side. Moreover, you've guided a number of master and bachelor students. Baronet today, uh, Chris Koch, Joost Geldof, and Tim van den Hoven. And you also acted as teaching assistant for the superconductivity course. Of course, the work in the lab could not have been done without many colleagues. And I would like to mention a few, in particular, Tim and Mark, who provided you with high quality materials. And then Hugo Slatte, Ruud Luikjes, Gerrit Handeman, Gerrit Hardeman, Ron Manapouti, Jan Beukers, Johan Moses, Johan Soeder. Stefan Bon and many others. <laughs> so 
all offer different kinds of technical support. Naka, Beach Kuba, we help with the pressure test. Alex McCollum for the measurements on uranium cobalt. And obvi obviously the ability to be able to work with all these different speakers are a good communicator and team. So without hesitation, and I think I can speak for a whole group, the whole team, we all enjoyed your company in the lab. Throughout the years, we had many interesting discussions and we also have a very active social life. We travel a lot, we meet friends all over Europe. Here in Amsterdam, you may parties. We're a frequent visitor of bars, often till late at night. I have you seen drinking incredible quantities of alcoholic beverages <laughs> without getting drunk. It's, it's impressive. Over the years, you must have siphoned many liters of beer and vodka into your stomach, a quantity that possibly could also have filled a modest swimming pool. <laughs> and I wonder who is more thirsty, you or the Heliox and the Kelvin Esquire stage. You also like good food, and good here means that it should contain at least a sizable piece of meat. In order to keep your body in good shape, you took up boxing again, and you also made it to captain of the quantum matter team in the yearly Okay, a few words about the future. In July, uh, you will start as a postdoc in the MUSR group at the Carl Scherer Institute in Switzerland. So if you arrive with success, for a co-funded Marie Curie. Well, in fact, when we were at the TSI last summer to carry out a series of new tools, I noticed you were very much you very much like to work in this Halle, an environment with big instruments and shocks, pressures, and strong magnetic fields. Of course, what really made you to decide to apply for a job at TSI excellent canteen food. In July, the sandwiches are even bigger than in Science Park. <laughs> so before closing, I would like to express my sincer, sincer thanks to the committee members for taking part in this uh, ceremony, especially the guests from outside our university. Dr. Uh, dear Ed and Artin, once more my congratulations. It's a very special day today. Much joy in celebrating the end of your life as a student and a doctor. Next week, you will travel back home to Cuba to your parents. And you will undoubtedly enjoy before the tough postdoc life at the TSI will start. With our expertise you will acquire there, I think it's yet another reason to keep in contact. Final words which have nothing to do with sandwiches and swimming pools, these are serious words. You guard the obtained dignity as an honor and a privilege, and never forget the attendant responsibilities which you now bear towards science and society. It is a pleasant duty, most learned scholar, to congratulate you also on behalf of the doctorate board. Hereby I declare the ceremony ended.